welcome Ari to the show. Thank you again for uh, sitting with us. This is going to be great. Totally. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. No problem. No problem. So um, the format of the show, for most people, you know, we go through and we kind of talk about, okay, what's your career in music from beginning to now, right? Mm -hmm. We've been switching it up. You are the second guest with our new format. And so we'll start off with a little backstory, of course, just for people who may not be familiar with who you are and your work. Um, of course, the second edition of your amazing book is coming out soon. So mm -hmm. we're gonna talk about that, but then I wanna have an overall conversation about what you feel the state of you know, the music industry is right now, um, specifically as it pertains to independent, unsigned or up and coming artists. You know, sure. so those words interchangeably. Um, yes. So for those who don't know who you are, you know, why don't you tell us what's important about you? Okay. Um, <laughs> sure. So I, um, I yeah, we'll I'll give you a little backstory. Um, I started my music career in Minneapolis as a singer songwriter. And um, I guess I can back up even more. I, I went to Minneapolis uh, for school. I went there uh, to the University of Minnesota to be a uh, high school band director. I was studying music education and classical trumpet. Uh, I realized very quickly I did not want to be a trumpet player and I did not want to teach high school. Um, and so I kind of transferred after that first year to a music industry school and I studied music business and songwriting. And I, this was right around 2005. And so this was a major transition time for the music industry. And what I was learning in school in my music business classes uh, was kind of how the music industry had operated up until that point. Right. Um, and, you know, we were doing classes learning about uh, how to negotiate record contracts and, and all of that stuff. And so basically what they taught me was if you want to have a career in music, you have to get a record deal. That was what we were taught. So as soon as I finished school, I was kind of like, all right, I'm ready to go. Where's my record deal? <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> like, right. they're like, well, you can't really have a career without a record deal. And I'm like, well, man, I'm, I don't really want to sit around and wait for this. So I decided to just kind of figure out how to make a music career happen for myself. And I, it was a lot of trial and error. And uh, at my peak, kind of, I, I grew my career in Minneapolis uh, where I was drawing about 800 people locally to my shows. I was selling out venues in a five state region. I was touring nationally. Um, and then I started to kind of uh, see other successes, getting songs placed on TV shows and movies and uh, charting on iTunes and all this stuff like without a record label, without a manager, kind of figuring out how to do it all on my own. And after a while, um, you know, musicians came to me and they're like, hey, uh, how are you doing this? Like, how did you get a song on TV? And how did you book this tour? Or is this a good deal that I'm getting from this club that I'm getting offered? And I would initially it was just kind of friends in Minneapolis. Then it spread to um, other people I was meeting when I was playing colleges and high schools and then festivals. And I got to a point where I was receiving so many messages from musicians all over the country just asking me questions because word spread. They're like, if you have a question about the music business, ask Ari. He gets back to you and he like has learned some things. <laughs> so like I was I got to a point where I just didn't have time to respond to everybody. Um, and so I um, I kind of my brother's a web developer and we put this blog together um, called Ari's Take. And I basically everything I was learning and running my own career, uh, I put up on the on the blog and all the questions that I was getting, um, I would write the answers to them and all the most frequently asked questions I was getting. And so when people would write in questions like, oh, I actually wrote about that over here and I would link them to the to the articles and inevitably people would have more questions and I'd learn more things. So I just kind of kept updating the blog as I learned more and uh, and then it, it just it kind of took off the blog kind of grew and more people were um, getting value from it and they were letting me know how helpful it was and then other publications kind of started to ask me to write for them and so I was writing for Digital Music News and Music Connection Magazine and a ton of other ones and uh, but the beauty of that was it actually gave me access to talk to anyone in the music industry that I wanted. Now, I wasn't just a, a musician with a blog. I was the writer, a writer for Digital Music News. And so right. 
I was able to sit down with all the movers and shakers of the industry and and ask them the questions that all the that musicians have, but we never had the access to ask them. Mm -hmm. And so I started learning um, so much. I literally I interviewed hundreds of people from artists, managers, and and people at Spotify and and music supervisors and publicists and publishers and and label execs and and people from all different avenues and aspects of the industry and and I would pass along everything I was learning and so it wasn't just about my experiences anymore it was about what I was hearing happen and I started to see this pattern I started to see that that musicians and artists were making uh, careers happen in really innovative interesting ways um and no one was talking about it you know billboard was was writing about how many records adele sold and like you know uh taylor swift's love life and like all the records beyonce was crushing i'm like that's cool but like that doesn't help me as an independent artist and that doesn't help all these other independent artists and right. i was hearing about all these stories from artists that were doing things in really innovative creative ways and succeeding and no one was talking about it so um i felt i needed to share those stories and and really um artists were coming to me they're like yo i've read all your blogs and they're helpful but I'm looking for something to connect the dots, to piece things together. Right. And they're like, what books do you recommend? And I've read most of the music business books out there. And unfortunately, there really wasn't one that was talking about the new music business from an artist's perspective on how to make it work and telling the stories about how artists were succeeding. So I felt that I, I really needed to write the book. Um, and that's that's kind of why you know I wrote the book, and and now that industry is changing so much, that book came out three years ago, and I'm now updated, and so just released the uh, the update, the second edition of that too. Right. Yeah, I can definitely co-sign. Um, I started studying <laughs> the industry in 2011. Um, went to college for music business at Berkeley in 2013, mm. and at that time you know, we're taking these music marketing courses and stuff. And, you know, the assigned reading is, all right, every morning, check Hypebot, check the Billboard business website, which were two wildly different perspectives. Yep. And then, but then here are the books. This, you read Passman, you read anything right. from Berkeley Press, right? And right. this, it goes on. And at that time, specifically in like 2013, it was just like, you were either getting a really old perspective of the business or you were getting like this snarky, like those guys don't know what they're talking about. Right. We're going to usurp the music industry with Bitcoin and take over everything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Those, those were the two perspectives. It was not oh until your book came right. out where it was like, oh my gosh, somebody finally wrote a book that it makes sense to read, you know? Yeah. So I was very, oh, uh, very happy when your book came out. Um, it you. is still, number one on my top five music business books lift list. Uh, you Amazing. just edged out Passman specifically nice. because you. of your perspective, you know, mm -hmm. coming from the perspective of an artist, it's like, yeah, these things are important. Record mm -hmm. deals can be important. You do need to know what these negotiating points are, but mm -hmm. you're probably not in that position yet to where it's mm -hmm. really a thing where you need to sit here and study all 50 pages of this, you know, it doesn't make sense. Right. So yeah, I really absolutely. appreciate that. Oh, well, thank you so much. I, it's really nice to hear and I appreciate that. And, and it's cool that the book resonated with you. And and yeah, you know, I've read Passman. Everyone's read Passman. His book's been around for 25 years. Um, the, the thing is, is that the music industry has changed slightly in 25 years. <laughs> so it's kind of like just a little bit. Um, so it's like his book's great. But like his book starts way up here when you mm -hmm. get the record label offer and the right. record deal. And my book starts at the beginning because there was nothing that was filled in those blanks. It's like, well, how do you get the record deal offer? <laughs> you right. know? His book opens with, you need a manager and a record deal and a publishing deal and an attorney. And then the question that everyone walks away from reading that book is like, how? How yeah. do I get that? Like, okay, cool. I know that on page, you know, 73 of the recording contract, I want to strike the controlled composition clause. Awesome. Got that down. But I don't have this deal to negotiate. So it's like, <laughs> right. and he never really talked about that. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to start at the beginning and say, here's how you build up your career to a point where it's sustainable. And then 
you'll start to get these offers and then you can decide if it makes more sense for you to sign the deal or continue to go at it on your own. And that's a personal decision that everyone's going to need to make for themselves. But at least you have learned how to create and sustain uh, a music career on your own. And that's honestly where we're at is labels don't even want to look at you until you're at a point where you have a business. And same with managers, you know, it's like managers need to manage a business. And if you don't have a business to manage, they aren't going to manage you. And so it's like, it's that, that catch 22, you know, chicken and the egg thing, as in a lot of artists are just like, well, how do I start my career without a label or without a manager? And you know, they don't want to manage me until I have a career. Mm -hmm. And then, so I've kind of like, well, here's how, and this isn't, you know, just from my perspective, which yes, I learned one way of doing things from trial and error, my own experience, but I learned it from then talking to so many other people about how they were doing it successfully too. Right. Right. So you've been <laughs> the, the sort of poster child for indie musician success for a while now. Like I said, when I got started, Ari's take was very much a big thing. Um, cool. And so I may have read all of your articles twice. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> <You know. laughs> That's awesome. That's great to hear. And so, you know, but having your unique position, right, where you were a working artist, you are a working artist, right? You've got mm -hmm. another funk outfit now. Um, mm -hmm. And so you've got that part of it. And then you're also navigating the business from the perspective of, you know, an actual business person, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How was it navigating that for you while acquiring this knowledge? Right. I mean, it's um, as an artist, uh, I can really empathize uh, with other artists and how challenging navigating a music career is. And I, I think that was the missing link and why so many people connected with Ari's take and with the book is they're like, oh, Ari gets us. He is mm -hmm. us. <laughs> like, he is me. Like, he understands how hard it is because it is hard. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't... I don't, you know, pretend it's easy. I just say, like, you can do it and here's how you do it. It's not easy, but if you're passionate and hardworking and talented enough, you can make it happen. Yeah. Um, but like personally navigating that, um, you know, I am, am uh, lucky in the sense that I am able to turn on my artist brain and turn off business brain mm -hmm. and flip those switches. Because like when I'm when I'm songwriting um, or working on my show or, you know, rehearsing, like I don't want to be thinking about business. I can't think about business. I can't write a song if I'm in business brain. And right. then similarly on the flip side, I can't really be effective with uh, working the business if I have my artist brain on the entire time and like I'm a sensitive artist because then uh, I'll take everything super personally and yeah. uh, and it's like my art and and I, it's like you know very very personal to me. So uh, I, I that's been the biggest thing that that has helped me to navigate everything um, from a, a, the business perspective and from yeah. the artist perspective is learning how to turn those things off and on and like chop myself in half and be like today I am businessman mm -hmm. and I have to put my business brains on and not take anything personally like an artist does. Mm -hmm. And really not think about that. And then when I get into the studio, it's like I am artist today and I'm not the businessman. And I need to just get super creative and totally go into that artist realm. Right. Um, and so that's definitely been a practice. And mm -hmm. uh, that's something that, you know, uh, I, I recommend people working on and practicing to do mm -hmm. Um is is maybe you know taking a day where you're that's going to be your writing day or that's going to be your rehearsing and that kind of stuff and then the next day will be your business day and mm -hmm. then you really go in on on that gotcha gotcha yeah that makes sense see i started as an artist kind of fell in love with the business and mm -hmm. i'm fully on the business side right cool. i can understand an artist right and their perspective and I enjoy great graphic design, things like that, but sure. I'm pretty much a business head. Um, so I think it's quite a skill to be able to switch back and forth. And we need the business heads. We need the business minds. And that's, that's uh, you know, a lot of artists um, struggle 
flipping on the business and and the artistry off. And so that's why managers are still necessary in some capacity, um, Mm -hmm. in in many capacities and in finding kind of a partner that can just do the business. uh, That's the best dynamic and relationship when you uh, think of it as a partnership and the artist can team up with somebody, whether it's looks like a traditional manager or just a friend who wants to help out Mm -hmm. um, that can really help uh, with those business aspects of the career. Got you. And that reminds me of the last interview we did. We were talking to uh, Wendy Day, who helped negotiate a lot of record deals, especially like in the hip hop world. Um, okay. I guess her claim to fame is she helped negotiate the publish or not, the distribution deal, uh, the $30 million distribution deal for Cash Money Records. Um, mm-hmm. So like the reason we know who Lil Wayne is, um, yeah. you know, she was a big part of that. And we were having a conversation about how an independent artist can navigate to the point where a label may be interested or whether or not they should even be pursuing relationships with a label. Right. Yeah. And what I find difficult about that conversation is if you're telling someone to find an investor or to find someone who's a business head or whatever that is yeah. that opens people up, you know, they're really vulnerable in that, that point, you yes. know? So what do you recommend for artists who are find it difficult to, you know, kind of get their head in the business game, but mm-hmm. you know, of course, you don't want to lead them into a spot where they're going to be taken advantage of. Sure. Well, absolutely. And that's a really great point. And um, you you definitely don't want to be, um, you have to have your guard up and you can't be super trusting on people that you don't really know. Because mm-hmm. unfortunately, there are a lot of snakes out there and there are a lot of people who are looking to take advantage of younger artists and ignorant artists. And so to not get taken advantage of, that's where the education comes in. And that's why you need to educate yourself Mm. on how things work. So, you know, the resources out there, that's another reason I wrote the book. So at least you understand how it all works. And then you have um, a foundation for, oh, okay, this is how a music career works. Now, I'd say the most important thing that you can do and that every artist should do, step one is to identify your goals. Create a goal sheet because I can't tell you what you need to do if I don't know who you are as an artist or what you're interested in. So right. for instance, you know, artists come to me, they're like, well, what do I do? I want to be, a, I want to be an artist. I want to be a, you know, full-time artist and, and make my money doing music. I'm like, that's awesome. But I don't know what, I, I don't know what your strengths and your weaknesses are. And I also don't know what kind of career you're looking to have. Like for instance, um, you know, there are artists out there who have no interest in touring or performing live. So telling them that they need to get on the road, that is, that's bad advice because they don't want to do that. So they don't need to do that if they don't want to. And there are artists who have built up very successful careers, um, just online from streaming and from video, from YouTube, uh, from Spotify, uh, that don't tour and don't want to tour. But on the other side, um, you know, there are artists who love performing and want to tour and want to perform Mm -hmm. and telling them that they need to focus all of their efforts exclusively on YouTube is also bad advice because that is then crushing their soul, their soul demands that they need to be on stage. Mm -hmm. And so that's why every artist needs to step one, identify your goals. And I encourage everyone to sit down and write out what are your six month goals, your one year goals, your five year goals. And these should, these need to be concrete goals, not not mm-hmm. like I want to be a full time musician or, or whatever. That's sure that's the overriding lifelong you know goal. But but we're talking specific concrete goals. So a solid six month goal is uh, I want to sell out this 500 cap venue in my hometown. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a solid goal. And once you set a, a, a tangible, concrete goal like that, you can then reverse engineer that. So right. then you're like, okay, now what is it going to take to achieve this goal, to sell out this venue? All right, well, that's 500 people, so that's 500 tickets. So I'm drawing 50 people now, so I'm going to need to 10x that. So let's put together a promotional plan. Now how am I going to book the venue? Let's team up with other artists. And then you start... You can actually uh, piece together the plan and the strategy and actually figure out how you will achieve that one very specific concrete goal. And mm-hmm. so you do that with with everything and you make the goal shift. And of course, your goals can evolve and shift. And so every six months, I think you break out that goal sheet, you reevaluate and you make sure that you're still on track. And maybe you shift some goals if if um, if that's what is um 
what you feel needs to happen at that at that moment. Um, so, you know, goals is, is absolutely, um, I would say, the, the number one thing that every artist should do that could really help get them on the right track. Got you. Yeah. I mean, if you set your goals, if you know where you want to go, it's a little bit easier to identify who can help take you there. Mm hmm. Mm hmm you know absolutely and yeah and you don't um and and that's the thing is because as you set these goals you can then see like okay how can i get there and do i need support to get there uh so for instance booking a, a a club in town and promoting a show you know, the support that you need isn't necessarily traditional industry support. Like mm -hmm. you just need to figure out who is the talent buyer at that club. Okay. You figured it out. Uh, what's their email or how can I get in touch with them? Figured that out. What kind of email should I send? Go to Ari's take and read how to send an email to a talent <laughs> buyer, <laughs> you know, and then, and then send them an email and then set it up the show. And like, you don't need traditional industry support to do that. Um, now, how are you going to promote it? Maybe you get some friends that can help you. Um, maybe you're not good at graphic design and you want to create a poster for the event or something like that. So get a friend to design something for you. Maybe right. you want to put a promo video together and you're not, uh, you don't know how to do video editing. Either go on YouTube and learn how to use Final Cut or iMovie or something like that, or have a friend who's good at video and loves your project edit video. So there's definitely ways where, where support can help. Um, when I started my career, uh, you know, this was uh, mid 2000s, uh, you know, 06, 07, 08. Uh, nine and uh, this was uh, putting posters up around town was actually a very effective strategy for me and so I didn't put every poster up by myself I had a team I had people that helped out and so that's support you know so there there are ways that you can gain support from other people in um, uh, that that want to help you out and then identifying who those people are and then how you want to get there because there's a lot of people who this is also a goal that you should not make mm -hmm. um, don't make a goal that says I want a manager or I want a booking agent. Those mm. are not good goals to have because those aren't real goals. Because so some people were like, well, I want a manager. My answer to them is why? Why do you want a manager? Like, well, because I, I, you know, I want to open for this artist and I think a manager can help me do that. I'm like, so your real goal is you want to open for that artist. So right. that's the goal. Now, let's see how you can open for that artist. It doesn't take a manager to get you to open for that artist. Right. You, and then we go through the steps. Okay, that's your goal. You want to open for this artist. All right. Is this artist touring through your hometown? Who's promoting the show? Who's their manager? How do we get in touch? You know, how many people can you draw? What's the pitch that artists want to see if you want to, um, you know, request to open their show? These are all the steps to achieve that goal. But your goal should never be, I need, I want a booking agent. I want a manager because it's like, you know, I want a booking agent. Why do you want a booking agent? Well, I want to go on tour. Well, you can book the tour yourself. Like you right. can do that. Like a booking agent, rem remember a booking agent and manager, they take commission on what you bring in. Mm -hmm. If you have no numbers and you're not bringing in much money, like that, they're not, you're not, no one's going to work with you until you can get to that point. Right. So when it comes to support and, and people that can help out your operation, if anybody comes in and you're not bringing in much money and they're like, Hey, let me, uh, you know, I want to, I want to help you out. First off, you, you got to ask them why, <laughs> like, thank you. But why, uh, I'm not bringing in much money right now. And then, but really set up that business, um, scenario is like, how is this going to look? And, and it happens all the time where friends come in and say, I want to help you out. Cause I believe in you and mm -hmm. that's awesome. Then take the support, but also think about, all right, so how will this look once there is money coming in? Mm -hmm. And that's important to discuss early on when there really isn't much money coming in. So then when money starts to come in, it doesn't get weird and there's no misconceptions and, and you've all, you worked it out from the beginning. Absolutely. Um, so, all right. So the conversation I wanted to have, uh, sure. kind of just about the current climate, right? You wrote sure. the original version of how to make in the music business. Almost the three, new music business. How to make it in the new music business. Yes. yes. <laughs> Almost three years ago. Correct. And one thing that's just been crazy to me is just the rate of change in the music industry. Yes. Um, the reason I stopped going to Berkeley was because I took a class about how to market music with Top Spin and mm. then Beats Music Top acquired Top Spin. Right. <laughs> and it was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know anymore. <laughs> so, you yep. know, but so things are popping up all the time, right? In the last. Yep three years since you know you released the book all mm. sorts of things have happened right absolutely so 
what prompted you to update the book? What were the, some of the things that were like, all right, I need to address this for this new yep. crop of artists coming up? Absolutely. And and uh, the, the plan is to update the book every three years uh, mm. in perpetuity. And because things shift and change so frequently, you know, I try to stay ahead of the curve and I try to see where the trends are heading. Mm -hmm. So when the book hits the shelves, I'm still a little bit ahead. And then by the time the next edition comes out, sure, the old edition is a little bit behind, but mm -hmm. then it kind of leads right in and passes the torch off to the next edition. So it kind of keeps <laughs> right. this flow going. Um, but, uh, you know, yes, with the new edition, I added about 50 pages of new information. Mm -hmm. um, I completely rewrote the social media chapter, as you can mm -hmm. imagine, is what's right. needed. Um, but the thing is, is how I approach the social media chapter and pretty much everything in the book. I don't say, for instance, use top spin or anything mm -hmm. like that because things come and go and platforms could die and whatnot. Um, I might say this artist used top spin and mm. used it in this way and it was successful for them. Look at platforms and avenues and, and programs um, that can be useful similar to that. So there are stories, a lot of stories that I tell of, of artists how they've used these um, platforms successfully. Um, but some of the biggest changes in the last three years that I really wanted to highlight with this next edition um, well, for one, um, you know, streaming uh, has really exploded. And of course, it was a thing in 2016. But, you know, and Spotify playlists, for instance, were a thing in 2016. But entire mm -hmm. ecosystems have popped up within the Spotify world. Uh, within Spotify playlists, there are, yeah. you know, playlist promotions companies. And there's uh, user-generated playlists. And there's algorithmic playlists now that are more powerful than the standard uh, created by Spotify playlist. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to touch on that. I really went deep on how the Spotify playlist uh, situation has has come and, and what's happening there. Um, but also I wanted to touch on direct marketing because that's something that's really exploded. Um, I've recently profiled a hip hop artist named Lucidius who he built up uh, his career uh, actually to a point where he is getting 5 million streams a month uh, making around $20,000 every month just from streaming wow. without any playlists. He's on zero official playlists. He's on no playlist. He has no record label and he's got no manager. And this is, uh, and so he did all this through direct marketing, through Facebook and Instagram advertising, mm. which is something, you know, three years ago, sure, Facebook advertising was a thing. Instagram advertising was not a thing. Right. Um, Instagram story ads just launched about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that, you know, artists have latched on to these new technologies very quickly. And the, the ones that have figured out how to make it work for them are the ones that succeed very quickly right away like Lucidius. And so mm -hmm. I tell his story. I talk about how direct marketing can be effective. Um, in the social media chapter, I also uh, discuss Instagram musicians, which have since become a thing. They weren't a thing in uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. um, you know, YouTubers were a thing in 2016, but they're much less of a thing now. Right. Uh, it's a very different way that people are operating on YouTube than they were. Um, and then also I dig into, um, over the years, I... Uh, I get a lot of Instagram DMs from artists who have read the book and they, you know, will either say they loved it or they'll say they have questions about it. And so I've kind of kept a running list of um, questions that I've received or things that maybe weren't super clear that needed clarifying. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of keep this running note sheet going. Um, other things that I've kind of um, updated uh, is really creating your um, the art, artist branding in your entire artist world um, mm -hmm. is something that, you know, as we're in this new era where we have to develop ourselves on our own and it's not as much labels and publicists kind of helping craft that image yet, um, it's really important for artists to um, really understand themselves and, and, and develop that world. And so I, I kind of touch on that um, as well. And then, you know, other things like Music Modernization Act went into... So got signed into law and so royalties have changed and the ways mm. that you can collect money. Uh, I made the book much more global uh, mm. before it was very U.S. focused. And since people have been reading it all over the world, I updated um, how you can collect royalties from all over the world and how you can succeed um, all over the world. And so, yeah, a lot of those gotcha. things. 
Nice. Um, well, yeah, it sounds like a must update for those of us who already have the first edition. Sure. Um, so that's great because there are definitely a lot of books where you feel like they just put out another edition like as like a cash grab. Like, oh, I changed right. the structure a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the same book still, though. Right, right, right. And yeah, no, I, you know, I felt it was very important um, to kind of uh, keep that updated. I mean, the, the philosophies stayed the same because yeah. that's like the core philosophies of what I stand by. But there's been so much that has changed. And I really wanted to make sure that I kind of covered all of that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of your core philosophy. So yes. I feel like one thing that you get flack for online is, sure. you know, the the idea that a label is not necessary. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think a part of it is just because, again, the overall narrative is either you need a record deal or the major label system and the whole of the music industry is the devil, right? And so because there's no in-between, I think you get a lot of flack for appearing to be on one side or over the other. Sure. Um, but what do you say to, for example, one of our guests uh, was an artist manager and I mm -hmm. saw he shared, uh, you know, you got a quote about, you know, labels aren't necessary or mm -hmm. you can do so much, so much of what you need to do without a label or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's someone who represents major label artists and he's like, yeah, I'm calling BS because you can't do, you can't get to XYZ place without a label. Um, where do you feel the role of labels is right now? Sure. Um, I would love to sit down with that guy and have a conversation because I want to know what XYZ is and what he defines that is because um, I could probably give him an example that disproves that in every in every aspect. You want to talk about top 40 hits? I have uh, five examples uh, that disprove that. Uh, you want to talk about Grammys? Chance the Rapper proved that. Uh, performing on SNL? Uh, you want to talk about selling out Madison Square Garden? Wolfpack just sold it out without a label. Um, so I, I can I can actually disprove that. I think there's there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. um, now, where major labels do fit in, if you want to be a superstar tomorrow, major labels is the best bet for you. Mm -hmm. So that's also what um, their that's what their entire business model is is turning you into a superstar and making you famous because the threshold for what success means for major labels is very different than the threshold for what it means to be successful as an independent artist. Right. Now, success is extremely personal. And mm -hmm. so everyone needs to define what success means for them. Like nobody can define success for you. And so if anybody says, well, you're not successful if X, Y, Z, you're not successful unless you have, you know, 100,000 Instagram followers or whatever. Like right. I can point to someone with 100,000 Instagram followers working a day job, you know, and I can also point to someone with 20,000 Instagram followers that just sold 2,000 tickets last night in LA. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, there are these metrics that get thrown all over the place and people use those metrics to reinforce their own beliefs when I'm like, let's just actually dig a little bit deeper and understand what, what we're talking about here. And so, yes, the function of major labels, let's not let's not forget it's to make people famous. Um, the, the president of Universal Republic, the largest major label in the world, uh, Avery Littman, he said that. He's like, our function is to make famous. We mm -hmm. are here to make you famous. That is what we do. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if that is your goal and you want to be famous tomorrow and that's all the thing that matters to you, sure, play the lottery. Because mm -hmm. let's not forget that the major label success rate, meaning uh, success being um, you make enough money on your first record, you recoup the cost of the advance, you make enough money that you actually get greenlit for a second album, mm -hmm. is the success rate is less than 2%. That means that over 98% of artists that sign to labels fail in that mm -hmm. they don't make the money, they get dropped from the label. And do you think the label gives you all your rights back? And it's like that, that record that you spent three years of your life and your blood, sweat, and tears that is personal about something that monumental that happened in your life, you want those songs back? Sure, we'll give them back to you for $250,000. You just write us a check and here, here's your rights back, you know? So yeah. it's like, it's a trade-off. Like, yeah. you can sign your soul to the devil and like you can sign your soul away and be like, here's, um, you know, and that's fine. If you're, not, if you're not emotionally attached to your music and your songs, no problem. If you want to take a crapshoot and you, want, you really want to be famous, um, sign to a major label. Absolutely. 
Um, now, I think it's more beneficial to go the slow grow because if mm-hmm. you build up your career to a point where you have every major label begging to work with you, then you can dictate the terms. Then you have clout. And then it's then you can say, okay, I'll sign with you. And we're starting to see more labels take this route where mm-hmm. they'll sign a licensing deal with you. They'll be mm-hmm. like, all right, we're not going to own everything. We're not going to take our standard 85% because remember, that's the standard rate that labels take. Um, we'll do a licensing deal. We'll do a 50-50 split or we'll even only take 15%. That's what some some labels are doing. You're not going to own anything, but we're starting to see new models evolve that way, but they're only being offered to artists that don't need labels. Right. And so that's the thing. So we are seeing, you know, there's a lot of artists, um, there's a lot of companies out there offering label services, mm-hmm. you know, so um, like Cobalt and AWOL, they're, they're ones that offer these kinds um, there's some bigger distribution companies like Ingrus and the Orchard that offer label services mm-hmm. and they don't own anything. So, you know, uh, there's a place for major labels, but the place for major labels are for superstars. And so um, that's playing the lottery in the crapshoot. Now, of course, we highlight the artists that we know that are at the top of the charts and that are headlining Coachella and they're like, oh, that's success and those are the superstars and look they all have major labels i'm like yeah okay but let me point to a hundred artists that you've never heard of that also had major labels that got mm-hmm. dropped from them and now are working at starbucks like mm-hmm. let's talk about those artists too because like you got to balance this out right. and so it's like we don't hear about those artists that got mm-hmm. dropped from their label and they're now working at starbucks we only hear about the success stories um I hear about the failures and so I'm like, (laughs) and I study the numbers and I'm like, yeah, it's a lottery. I think you actually have a much better chance of having a full career, a successful career if you go at it independently for at least a little bit. And, And that's like, what is your ultimate goal? If your ultimate goal is to become famous, like, okay, like go make a sex tape or something. That's a lot easier than like try, you know, work in the major label game. If like you just want to be famous and that's it, like there's ways to be famous that is much easier than music. But, you know, if you actually want to have a music career and you want to have a lifelong music career, then I would not sign with a label right away. I would build up your career to a point where labels are actually hitting you up and saying, you know what, we love what you're doing, we believe in you, we wanna work with you, and then you can decide, is this the right fit for me at this moment? And that's a personal decision. So I'm not anti-major label as it sounds. I know I shit on them a lot (laughs) Um, because I've seen major labels screw over artists a lot and it pisses me off. Like that really upsets me and so like, you know, I look out for artists. I've had a lot of my friends get taken advantage of by labels. I've had a lot of my friends get screwed over by labels and quit music because mm-hmm. of labels. And that breaks my heart every single time. And so I'm like, all right, yes, it's sexy to say I just signed to Capitol Records or whatever. But what is less sexy is then getting dropped two years later and having to go work at Starbucks. So it's like, you know, if you build up your career a little bit uh, slower independently yes it'll it'll take a little bit slower but if you build that up you'll have a much more sustainable career with a fan base that cares about you and that identifies with you as an artist versus you know uh they like that one song that they heard on that one spotify playlist that your label got you in there because yeah a label signing with a major They'll get you a few million streams the the you know month your song comes out because they have guaranteed slots on hot playlists. They can insert your song, boom, you got three million streams. You may feel like a success because of that, but let's check in in six months and a year from now because if you get dropped or you don't, your next singles don't really connect or pop. How many fans are really do you have? How many tickets are you selling? And how many people are actually along with you because they identify and love you and they don't just love that Spotify playlist or don't just love that one radio station, you know? Right. Absolutely. So um, as we wrap up, I wanted to ask, you know, you know, since the first edition of the book came out, Ari's take has grown from just a blog, you know, to now you've got all sorts of ways where you support artists. You, you've Mm -hmm. got these private events, you go on tours. Um, Mm -hmm. If people need or, would like a little bit more context or just 
someone to walk a little bit further in this with them, how can they yeah. reach out to you to do that? Um, I, I think the the best way uh, to stay in touch, um, I would encourage everyone to get on my email list. Uh, that's where I send out a lot of information. Um, it's where I send all my Ari's Take articles, but also everything that I'm doing and everything that I'm offering and uh, everything that I learn. And uh, so that's just at ariestake.com. You can just sign up on the email list. Um, also, you know, if you just want to send me a quick message, I'm on Instagram. So that's an easy way to do that. Um, just at Ari Herstand on Instagram. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I put all my articles on Ari's take.com. Um, and I, I'm constantly looking for ways to support artists. And, and as I learn new things, um, and, uh, new tactics, I, I come up with ways that I can do that. So that's, you know, why I speak at a bunch of conferences, because mm -hmm. I know that a lot of people are at conferences. I can share the information there. Um, it's why I started Ari's take Academy, which is an online school. Uh, so we can teach, so we get, it's much more hands-on personalized attention with uh, very in-depth lessons on what we're learning now. So like I mentioned Lucidius earlier, I hit him up. I'm like, yo, we have to share with people how this is working. Like, how did you get to 5 million streams a month without playlists? Like, mm -hmm. let's teach people how to do that because that's incredible. Right. And so before we launched the course, like we tested this with 10 other artists and it worked for every single artist. We're like, all right, let's, let's teach people this because this is important. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the schools out there really aren't teaching this kind of stuff. So I'm like, well, if all the major universities aren't gonna teach this, I guess I'm going to teach this <laughs> just right. like it's kind of like why if there are no books out there that are talking about this stuff, I guess I have to write the book. Right. So that's kind of how I've come at everything is like uh, if uh, if there's going to be that void, I'm going to try to fill it. Got you. Well, all right. Thank you so much for your time. This has been a great conversation. Um, <laughs> so how to make it in the new music business. The second edition um, is out now. It's available for pre-order. Um, yes. At, at the time we record it, by the time this comes out, it should be out. Uh, but cool. the great thing about Amazon pre-order links is that they turn into regular buying links. So yeah. I will leave all of that in the show notes in the description of this YouTube video. Perfect. All right. Cool. Well, uh, thanks again for your time, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That was a lot of fun.